Okay, good morning. <clears throat> How is everyone this morning? I know it seems strange that I'm teaching Bill's class and Bill's sitting there, but uh, Bill's got a few things going on, so I'm filling in for him this morning. Before we start our class, uh, Mark Meadows, if you'll lead us in a prayer. Okay, um, to start our class this morning, and Tim's not in here, but I was going to talk about Tim. Uh, we'll start with Ecclesiastes chapter 3, if part of the lesson. But Ecclesiastes chapter 3, everything has its time. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal. A time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, a time to re refrain from embracing, a time to gain, a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war. In a time of peace. We're actually going to use verse 7 in, in part of the, the, the lesson this morning, but this is a time for our congregation where we make a transition from uh, obviously Mark Bass and Joanne and then Herschel the last several years uh, to Tim Hatfield. And I was saying this morning that back in 1979, Denise and I got married. I think this was the second wedding here at the church, but uh, and then early 1980, we moved back to Columbus and started attending here, and, and we were young. And uh, so there was no elders at the time. The church was about the, was probably larger than it is now. And uh, coming from Ohio Valley College, at that time it was Ohio Valley College, the men asked us to, to work with the youth, which there was a lot of youth at that time, and we did. Uh, dumb and stupid probably is what we were, but we did it, and... Uh, and part of that group was, uh, Rachel's here, she was part of that group, but Tim was part of that group. Uh, surprising after he was in our group that he became a preacher, but hey, things happen. But one of the things that we did as a group, we really enjoyed being together and we did a lot of things. Uh, but we spent time going to visit. Uh, we went to Ohio Valley College. Again, it was Ohio Valley College at the time. We would go there for homecoming and different programs. So maybe there was a seat planet uh, for Tim, who later went there. And I think he was part of the first four-year program when Ohio Valley College started a four-year program in Bible. And uh, so the rest in here is. Now today, we start where he actually is now our preacher here at Alki Road. And so, you know, we pray for good things. And obviously we pray for Mark and Joanne as they search. And, uh, and they try to find a, a home where they can continue to do work for the Lord. But what I wanted to talk about today was talk, is tongue. Um, again, I've said it over and over, when I teach class, the hardest thing is when nobody tells you what to teach on, it's, it's what to teach on. And, and so you, you start fumbling through things and, and what you think and this and that. And So what I came up with, and we'll see how it works, we got uh, 45 minutes or so, 40 minutes to, to try to figure it out. But So when we look at Ecclesiastics, when it talks about time to do all these different things, and these are all of Obviously, a scripture that's used a lot in weddings and funerals because of the same, some of the things that it talks about. So, but it, it tells, tells us there's a time to keep silent and a time to speak. Which is which? Wouldn't it be something if we really knew when it's time to just shut up and not say anything? A lot of times we don't. We have... Two ears, but we won't have one mouth. What usually works over time? 
Oh, I don't watch that enough to know. So shut up and listen to me talk. Is that what? Yeah. But you think about it, that, that's what we have. But what happens so often is we speak before we think. And, you know, when I think about Jesus and his teachings, and we'll look at some of those things. But one of the things I think about with Jesus, especially with the scribes and the Pharisees and all the things that were going on, to be put in that situation, and to, what I picture Jesus is to be slow to speak. He's quick to listen, but slow to speak because he thinks about what he should say. And that's really what, and we'll look at that passage that tells us to do that. But it's hard to, for me, it's hard to practice that what I preach because it's easier for me to say something. And uh, Denise and I have been married almost 40 years. It'll be 40 years this, year, this week, or not this week, but, but this year. And one of the things that she'll say is, shut up and let me finish. Because I know what she's going to say before she does. So I'll stop right in the middle of her conversation to start my own. And she'll say, just shut up and let me finish. And that's what happens. A lot of times we're, we're quick to speak and, and we should be listening. And that's what the scripture tells us that we should do. Let's turn to the book of James. Anybody else want any confession, got any confessions they want to make about what their significant others say to them? In the book of James... I want to look at chapter 3, but I, first we should look at chapter 2, because chapter 2, verse 14, uh, it talks to it, it says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked or destitute of daily food, and one of, one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them things that they are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But you do what, but do you want, let me start again, verse 20. But do you Want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by his works faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled which said, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by his works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. So we have James there talk about our faith, but how works are important. And so as a Christian, basically we have to work. We, we have to do things, and that is how people will see our faith by the works that we do. And then he starts in chapter 3. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. <clears throat> Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a force a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it's set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird and reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, fully of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be. Does a spring sing, send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brother, bear olives? Or a grapevine bear figs. 
Thus, no spring yields both salt water and fresh. Okay, so James here is talking about the tongue. Let's talk about the tongue for a second. When I, I can remember as a kid, I probably still do, but what's the doctor say when he tells you to stick out your what? Stick out your tongue. What does the tongue tell us? We have medical people here, so what's the tongue tell us about medically about us? Yeah, there, so obviously there's, there's things, the doctors, and when I was obviously doing this class and looking, there's different things that will tell you about the color of your tongue, will tell you about things that are going on in your body. So the tongue does uh, provide a, a medical uh, scale or gives, us a, gives the doctors or the medical professions could tell us something about our tongue, what's happening with us. Um, so when we think about the tongue, how small of a part of our body it is but how it says that we cannot tame it is that true the scriptures say it <laughs> Herschel okay Herschel says we can control it but it's a continuous job but we have to control it because if we don't uh, and it talks about what's what are the results of uh, the effects of our tongue. The first words spoken over the telephone, what were they? <laughs> Mr. Watson, come here, I want you. Those were the first words that were spoken over the telephone. Oh, okay. That's, that wasn't in my notes, but I'll take your word for it. What hath God wrought? Those were the first words sent by Morse code out of the telegraph wire. Do we still have telegraph wire? Do we? That's good to know. Do we still need to use Morse code? Pardon me? Really? Oh, okay. Send checks through it and wire, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. Uh, how about one small step for mankind? One small step for man? One giant leap for mankind. Who uttered those words? Neil Armstrong, when he stepped on the moon. How about uh, I have a dream? Martin Luther King. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask instead what you can do for your country. Yeah, JFK. So when we speak words, they they. Uh, one of the things that I read, and if I get to it with all my jumble here, but really our words are like a resume. Because what our words do is they tell who we are. And that's of those who are Christians who work in the world. When you have a discussion with someone, what usually comes up, what usually is in their dialogue in a normal conversation? Yeah. I mean, cussing, at least in, in the construction side where I am and, and uh, the people that I deal with, even those who are in pro professional. Yeah, um, but I think most of us now, I, I think that the world we live in today, that it's part of a normal dialogue. Uh, I can remember TV. You never heard anything, but now it's, I mean, it's, there's, there's no long, I don't believe there's any, any regulations any far any longer about speech in a certain time I, I mean you you I'm surprised at what you hear said on TV on normal in the the course of a, a normal telecast so um, but when you think about words and our words and, and we'll look at scripture that, that set, shows us that that basically it's it's what it says who we are the words that we choose and how we speak it, it basically tells people what things about us. And like I said, if, if cussing is a normal part of vocabulary today in the world, but they don't hear us, even in situations where normally it would, if somebody makes a mistake or whatever it might be, and when they don't see that from us, what does that tell them about us? Pardon me? That we're different. It separates us. It separates us. We're, we're different from the world. 
And, and that's what it says that we're supposed to be. We're in the world, but we're not to be of the world. And so we're to, we're to try to light a spark for others as opposed to us just blending in. And how easy it would be to blend in, wouldn't it? Uh, I can remember working jobs and after working there for years and, and then leave, one of the comments would be, I always try to listen to see if you would say a cuss word. It's like, well, why? I mean, why waste your time? It, yeah, to kind of trap you. But So it's important that, that when we speak that um, we, we're careful what we say. Reach, researchers say we will open our mouths 700 times a day. Now that's normal. Some of us are abnormal and we speak to a lot more. And we'll say on an average 18,000 words in a day. So again, that, that's, some of us are a lot higher and some are very low. So, but that's the average, what researchers say. So think about the opportunities. Every time we address someone, we have an opportunity to either be, and we'll get to it, but uh, there's part of what I'm looking at that says there's hell words and there's heaven words. And we, we have an opportunity to use those words in, in the right way, use our words in the right way to show who we are, who we believe in, by what we, what we say. Uh, I can remember, it, it doesn't happen much anymore, but it used to be when you would, would go into McDonald's, they were trained to just basically say, may I help you? Do you hear that anymore when you go in? Yeah, no, today, that, that's, that's, they're in a normal discussion, but, but we've lost the, that as a society, we've put, taken the importance of that away because we still go and I'll still order my food even though I'm not giving customer service or, but we've accepted that because we accept it, the bars just keep going lower and lower. Okay, we were Chick-fil-A yesterday and we were talking about the difference of, and Amanda had to think about the drive through line that the drive through line at Chick-fil-A is like a mile and a half, but it only takes you a minute and a half, and they treat you like you're a relative, and they give you condiments and all those things, where McDonald's can be two cars, but it takes two days to get through. And So Chick-fil-A, yes, that's, that's, but that's the training. That's what, if you work there, that's what's expected of you to work there, and they always look nice, and, and uh, so, but, but yes, that's, I mean, that's, that's a proof there that if you expect from your employees this and require it, that's what. And I think when we look at Scripture, we could say that's what God requires of us to do this. Now, is it easy? If it was easy, uh, it wouldn't be a point, but it's not easy. But we have to work at that. So we have to work on thinking of what we say before we speak. Well, I mean, that's in the world we live in. That's a normal vocabulary. I mean, that's in, in and I've had to look at it, but I I know. Listen to sometimes I listen to country music. I know it's hard to believe, but I do. And one of the songs, I don't even know who it is, but he talks about his son, maybe a four-year-old son, and driving, and they spill something, and, he, and his son says a four-letter word. It kind of shocks him. And then later that night, his son's saying his prayer. And he, but what the point of the song is. The son is imitating the father. So if the son hears the father swear, cuss, when something bad happens, you spill something, you do something, that's, but then when they see, so they see out of the same example, good and bad. And so what we don't want to be is that example of good and bad. We want to just be the example of good. No, I mean, it's why it's so normal, I, you know, and I don't, I'm never in schools anymore, so I, I don't know what happens in classrooms. I don't know if that's part of a normal vocabulary of a teacher now, to use that part of their, if that's... I mean, Rachel, you're, it, it would be hard, again, it's, it's what you practice is what you are. If, if I can't carry on a conversation without using certain words, probably most of my conversation, they'll slip in. And, but, but in our schools, probably, most of the students are used to it, and it's, it's almost become the norm. And that's not right. It's so abnormal to me, and I just, it's so offensive to my ears. It's almost hard to believe. Yeah. Well, it's, 
Yes. The point here says conversation is a very important element in man's personality. Not only is what one says important, but also how he says it. For good or ill, your conversation is your advertisement. Every time you open your mouth, you let man look into your mind. Do they see it well clothed, neat, businesslike? Silence is one of the greatest arts of conversation. So catch that last line. Silence is one of the great arts of conversation. How hard is that to just be silent? You know, I'm in sales. I've gone to sales seminars. And one of the things that they'll say is that when you make a statement, then you shut up. Now, for me, I don't, it's hard to shut up. So what's silence in, in most times? What's silence? It's, it's, it's what? Listening. It's listening, but when there is silence, like right now, if I sat there for 10 minutes and didn't say a word, you guys would be going, uh, what's going on? <laughs> Something's going on here. Is my mic? Hello? But silence is awkward. It's awkward. And so if, if I'm in a sales meeting and I say to Mark Meadows, you need to buy this $500,000 crusher. My job is to shut up and hear what Mark says. Give him an opportunity to speak. But what happens is, as he's thinking about it, I'll start talking, and I might talk myself out of a sale because I just keep blabbering instead of doing what wise people tell me to do, and that is shut up. Sometimes, like here, silence is, a, is great. So... I shut up, I listen, Mark the customer tells me what he is or isn't, and, and then, but if I keep talking, most times you'll talk yourself out of something. It's the same thing with the church. If you invite someone to church, and you invite them, and they don't say anything, and there's a pause there, then just let it pause. Wait for them to say something. And that's where you'll go next. Because they could be thinking about what excuse can I make? Um, but let them speak. So we sometimes being silent is okay. On a windswept hill in the English country court, churchyard stands a drab gray slate tombstone. The faint edgings read, Beneath this stone, a lump of clay, lies Arabelle Young, who on the 24th of May began to hold her tongue. Did you catch that? It wasn't until she died till she, did she start to hold her tongue. So that's what she was known for. So when we think about what James says in this, this verse, this chapter, conversation is important. Matthew chapter 15, verse 11. Someone quote that or read that. Matthew 15, 11. Because I don't like to eat a lot of things, so I think this is reverse, but I'm not going to argue with God. What's Matthew 15, 11 say? Okay. If you watch some of these food networks, some of the things you see people eat and things, but that's, what that says is that what comes in doesn't defile us. Defy, defy us. What does? What comes out? What comes out of our mouth? Verbal, words, what we say. So it's important that, that uh, we say, as a kid, and we probably as parents told our kids when they say, somebody says something, we say the old thing, sticks and stones. Gotta say it louder for the people who are streaming live. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never harm me. Is that what we say? Is that true? No, it's not true. No, it's not true at all. Um, you know, when we think about when you overhear people in stores or whatever, and you hear people the way they talk to, to you assume they're kids, but um, what we say has a big bearing on what people think about themselves. And uh, imagine a, a, a family, a child growing up in a home where they're told repeatedly, I wish you weren't born, or you'll never amount to anything. 
you know, the things that you, that you can imagine being spoken by people who think, don't think at all and just speak and, and how that person is to grow and, and that's why the church is so important to be an avenue for people to, to be an escape maybe for those people that are put in those type of situations so uh, we can say good things we can say bad things people are raised in different environments that we, we can't control but, uh, but they're there we know they're there and, and how people basically how, how they live it's, it's questionable how, how it happens, but, but it's what comes out of our mouth is what defies us, defiles us. In James chapter 1, I'm there, so I'll read it. James says, James 1.19, he says, So then, my brethren, my, so then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. What typically happens when someone gets mad? This opens, doesn't it? And we say things, we blurt out, we say, say, but what James is telling us, again, and we look at James 2 with our faith and our works, and, and James 1 is telling us that we are to be um, slow to speak. We're, we're to be, he tells us, Swift to hear, slow to speak, and then slow to wrath. So James tells us that. We can look at Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19. If someone will turn that, Proverbs 10, 19, and then Proverbs 17, 27. So Proverbs 10, 19. Anyone? Proverbs 10? 17 or 19? Okay. So what's that say? A wise man does what? Shuts up. Shuts up. <laughs> exactly. To put it in today's terms, a wise man shuts up, knows when to shut up. How about Proverbs 17, 27? Okay, so if you want to seem very wise and knowledgeable, best thing to do is just what? Shut up. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's just basically to to, to shut up. <laughs> yeah. If you didn't hear David, you can ask him. He can repeat that after. But no. Say it again, David, a little bit louder. Better keep your mouth shut and let people think you're a fool than open your mouth and move all down. Okay. All right. So you got that. That's a, an old saying. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4 31 and 32 it says to us Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you. With all malice, and be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. So think about if you, who you, let's say, you have to take a 12 hour car ride and you have to pick a passenger. Yeah. Who, who do you want riding next to you? Think about if you could select. Do you want that wise person who just shuts up? And listens to you <laughs> or do we want to hear somebody who just goes on and on and on and every other word's a cuss word and it's this and it's that and, it, it, and we should think about that when we select people that obviously we can't always control who we work with and, and in that situation but we can control who we associate with who we go to whatever we do whether we whether you fish whether you golf shop, what, I mean, whatever you choose to do, we can select the people that we want to be with who have that type of dialogue, who build up or tear down. And that's, we can control that. We can't control everything, but we can control who we choose then to, to associate with outside of uh, work or whatever.
And on the opposite end, the people who know Nikki are going, oh, I don't want Nikki to preach to me. So, which is good. I mean, it's, if people choose not to talk to us because they know what we stand for. That's that's a fact. Yep, yep. <laughs> so we have to be careful what we say because people do listen. No, you state the fact. Yep. Any else? Any have other comments people want to add at this point? In Romans, the chapter three, verse twenty-three says to us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. When we look at Romans chapter 3, verse 23, or verse 13 and 14, it says, Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongue they have pierced deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. I mean, think about that. Their tongue practiced deceit. So when we look back in James, he, he gives us a good analogy of the tongue. And what he re refers to is a horse. Now, the, the thing that's, that I love about the Bible is the simplicity of Scripture. Everyone, even illiterate people, know what a horse is. Now, uh, Denise and I love to go to the fair. Uh, it could be that I work the fair booth in the morning and she comes in the afternoon and we spend the rest of the day. Or, But one of the things she likes to see at the fair are the Clydesdales. Clydesdale horses. You know, a Clydesdale horse weighs about 15, about a, one and a half tons. So it's 3,000 pounds. And they're about six feet tall, which means I have to look up to them. But that's a Clydesdale. You know how wide, how big a bit is? The average bit? Yes, you know. Five inches. So think about a, a ton and a half horse is controlled by a five inch bit that goes in its mouth. And, and by controlling its mouth, you control the whole horse. That's how wide a bit is. Five inches. You know, they're, yeah, from side to side. Yeah, it goes right back. I've, I'm not a person like that, but I've... So, but a, but a, but a Clydesdale, one and a half ton, a beautiful horse, one of the largest horses. But we train them to... to but they're trained with a bit. And the, with, with a bit we can control where that horse goes. And James is using that as an analogy, that as our tongue goes, where do we go? If our tongue is full of sin and deceit and lying, where do we go? In the gutter, right? Um, Revelation 21.8 says that all liars are doing what? I quoted this all the time to brothers and college when I was there, but it tells us in Revelation 21.8, all liars swim in a lake of fire. Now, it doesn't say just white lies. It says all liars basically swim in a lake of fire. That that's, that's part of um, it, it's, it's, it's not good, but, but it uses that analogy how the tongue we can use the tongue and it can control us in the wrong way. Have people probably lost their jobs? Well, yeah, we can look at the political system. Have people lost their jobs because of things that they said? Yeah, they have. Uh, if you're caught in a lie, most employers, if you're caught in a lie, you would be terminated. Um, so when we think about the effect the tongue has on us as people, as humans, it, it's, it, it, it's true. It's there. It also talks about the rudder of a ship and how large a ship is but how a rudder can control where it goes but it also talks about it's a fire and uh, this is way before my time the Chicago fire who remembers that who was around at that time nobody 
Uh, it would happen in October 8th through the 10th, 1871. The effect of that was over 300 people were killed. There were 100,000 people homeless. Back in those times, it did $200 million worth of damage. How did that fire start by legend? How's it, how did it start? Yeah. The O'Leary Farm, a cow kicked over a lantern, supposedly, and that spark, that one spark, created all of that. Last year in California was the worst year for fires, for forest fires. There were 8,527 fires in California. There was 1,893,913 acres destroyed, $3.5 billion worth of damage done because of fires in California. So when we think about what a spark can do, the damage it can do to those around us, the, to the, the damage a fire can do, how much damage can a tongue do to relationships? Far more than what's here. I mean, this, when you think about how destructive fire is, the tongue is more destructive. And the, the pain that it can cause and, and what it can do. So it's important that we look at, and then uh, in James he talks about water, and he talks about a tree. A fig tree doesn't bear olives, and, and he talks about a, a clear stream of fresh water doesn't produce salt water. So we can't be hypocrites where we speak one way here, but then our dialogue changes with a different audience. Can we do that? We can do it, but is it right? It's not right. It's not right. So what we have to choose, what we have to work towards, is that we control our tongue because the damage that it can do could be irreversible. It could be irreversible. I mean, think about, again, we, you know, when we look at the world we live in and, and we see people who, um, you know, if someone has, and I know I've talked about it in class before, but if they have a WWJD kind of bracelet on, what do you think that person is saying? They're saying here that I'm a Christian. But then what do their actions say when we hear them spew out vile things from their mouth? We see them drink alcohol or do other things that tells us that this is just a ban, that they're not living that. And like Jeff says, we as Christians, we can blow an opportunity to teach someone because of our words, the way they see us live our life as opposed to the way we show our life. And you'll have that. I mean, there will be people who, after they realize, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. So. Either they're quiet around me or they're Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You can still communicate. Just choose your words when you speak to me. That's all. Yeah. Two stories. The story is told of a young lady who was eagerly awaiting the arrival of her boyfriend for their first date. Although he wasn't due to arrive for some time, the doorbell rang while she was fixing her hair. Without thinking, she answered the door with her hair standing on end, no makeup, and wearing her favorite pajamas. When she opened the door, she found herself standing face to face with her new date. The surprise left her utterly embarrassed, but not defeated. 
She made the best of the situation by smiling and saying, well, what do you think? Her date grinned and said gently, it looks like something beautiful is about to happen. He obviously stole her heart that very moment. There's another story of a stupid husband. <laughs> about a time when a husband came home one afternoon and caught his wife with her hair up in huge curlers. He says to her, what happened to your hair? The wife replied, I said it. The husband jokingly responded, if you said it, then when does it go off? <laughs> so you can see with uh, the two different situations how they were handled and probably the effects of the two different conversations. Um, so when we think about what I want to talk about here towards the end is one of the things I talked to that I read it says your words come out of your mouth they have a mission the words either enable heaven or hell you can always tell when you are listening to the words of hell they sound like this you're worthless you're just like your father I don't know why that's considered bad but uh, you're worthless you're just like your father you should never have been born you will never amount to anything you're stupid so what the words of hell do is they degrade your self-worth, your value, and, and limit your future, future potential. Words from heaven sound more like, you are loved, you are destined for greatness, you're precious, you will obtain much in your future. So you can see how there's positive and there's negative with the words that we choose and how we respond to people in different situations. I mean, it could be as simple as, again, go to McDonald's. We go to McDonald's and they mess up your order. Maybe they don't do because you don't ever eat everything the way they serve it, but some of us don't. So uh, if, if we get the wrong item or we, something happens, how do we respond to that situation? Do we do it with, no matter what the situation is, do we do it with kindness? Do we choose to act like heaven people or do we act like hell people? Because our actions, our words, that might be the only time that they see us. So imagine if, if that happens, and I'm teaching class, and somebody from McDonald's is streaming, and they go, oh, that's that guy that yelled at me, cussed me out because I messed, I put pickles on his hamburger. Now, how would that be if that's what I did? I didn't do that. I mean, even though I don't like pickles, I would not go that far. But so imagine if we're trying to live a way, but we forget who we talk to in another way. How can I invite a coworker to come to church with me when they see the, uh, the wrong side of, of how I live my life? And so when we think about what James says here uh, in chapter 3, we need to, if we're truly Christians and we're following, then we need to basically make sure that what comes out of our mouth are blessings. Because we can say good things or we can choose to say bad like the boy who saw the date for the first time looks like something good's going to happen and the husband when's it going to happen so but we need to we need to make sure that as we choose our words we be slow to speak quick to hear slow to wrath like it says the scriptures tell us that so if you get nothing else from this class be patient when it comes to speaking. Think before you speak. Don't be quick to respond because that response could have a dire effect on relationships that you have. Comments? I'm not so sure about that first one with the older kid. The man right there, it looks like something beautiful about that. That's not, I don't know how much of a comment that is. That boy was raised right. Well, I mean, it was a comment knowing that it was, yeah, it's. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, he could have responded like the second guy and made some spy comment. And the, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we're not judging people's looks here in class, so that's... No. I'm talking about the people yes. Like the music, uh, that stuff on yes. No. That and the people in the world who do that. I mean, that's yes. Yeah. 
But just remember that people see our actions, they see our words, and they tell a, a lot about us. So uh, let's try to control our tongue more, be more patient when we speak. Any other comments? What is? Profanity. My wise mother-in-law tells us that profanity is the best thing to show weak minds, right? Is that kind of what it says? That, is that what you're saying? She says the profanity is the strongest example of a weak mind. So, and with that, I thank you.